Well, happy Father's Day to the dads. Um, I know we live in a culture that loves to beat you up and make you the butt of every sitcom joke. Uh, And frankly, I think we can even do this in the church, right? Like you come in here on Mother's Day and it's this really beautiful day where we're, we're so grateful for you moms. We're so glad you're here and we really are. And so we give out flowers. It's a really sweet day. And then it comes to Father's Day and you walk in here and it's like nice to see that you showed up today. Guess there wasn't a game on. You better buckle up for pastor's message today. And and look, I I don't want to do that today. I I don't want to beat you up. I want to build you up. And and we're going to be looking at a a song from the Old Testament that's designed to do just that. So if you've got a Bible, why don't you go ahead and grab it and turn there. Um, Psalm 127 was written by uh, a man the Bible says is the wisest human to ever live. So that would make him the wisest dad to ever live. And, And here's what he says about parenting. Psalm 127 goes like this. When, excuse me, 127, not 126. Here we go. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the city gate. All right, that last verse right there, that's the goal. Um, Blessed is the one, or you know that word, if you've been here in this series, blessed could also be translated happy. It's saying um, happy is the man, flourishing is the person. That's what we're aiming for this morning. Um, I want to build you up. I I want God to build me up through his word. I want to be a flourishing dad. I want you to be a flourishing dad. And, And even if you're not a dad, there is good news in this psalm for you regardless of your phase of life that we're going to be seeing this morning. And so to get to that place of blessedness, I just want to look at three things this morning to unpack it for us. We're going to look at first the adventure, then the futility, and then the rest. Uh, Let's start with the adventure. Um, Any guys out there like to build? (laughs) Right? Like, yeah, that's why we gave you tools on Father's Day. And every guy loves to build, even if you're about as handy as I am, which I wouldn't even know how to use all of those tools. I'm that handy. But Chris could definitely show me. Um, we love to build. What, so I think what's interesting is I was thinking about Father's Day is this psalm actually moves from building a house to talking about having kids. In the span of just a few verses, by the way, it's not like he was running out of steam and had to throw something in in the end there. He goes from building a house to talking about having kids, which could sound really weird at first. Um, But um, actually, a house is a really common metaphor in the Old Testament uh, for talking about children. Um, Some of you will know this story, but Solomon's dad, David, uh, he was the king. We looked at a psalm from him last week, and um, when David kind of had rest from all of his enemies, when when he was just at a point where everything was going well, he said to God, hey, God, um, I just built my own palace here. It's pretty nice. Um, God, I'd like to build you a house. I want you to have a a permanent dwelling place. Get out of the tent, get into a permanent dwelling place where you can be here with us, Israel. And and God says to David, that's cute that you thought I needed a house. Um, But no, you're not going to build a house for me, David. I'm going to build a house for you. And and if you read the chapter, this is 2 Samuel chapter 7, he's talking about David's son, Solomon, and the sons that would come from Solomon, ultimately leading to the Lord Jesus, the, this, this house, this lineage of offspring. So this is a way um, that God will speak about children, about building a house is building kids. And so Solomon's drawing on all of that here when he writes Psalm 127 for us. He's saying, guys, you know how exciting it is to come home and have a project you get to work on? You know how great it is to bust out those power tools? 
Well, parenting is a lot like that. It, where, where you get to take this, um, the raw material of these little humans and, and you get to build them up. So, so you take a little kindness, a little love, and, you know, you teach them important things like faithfulness and responsibility, and you put them in all sorts of sports, right, just to see kind of what's going to stick. <laughs> like, oh, maybe they'll like this one. Nope, that's not their sport. And, and, and then you teach them, you know, uh, like you teach them the right sports teams to cheer for. Like in this house, we cheer for the Giants, not the Dodgers. We for sure don't do that. And so you build them up into this house. This is the biblical image of parenting. Now, not to build up a mini you that has all your preferences and lives out your dream and finally does that thing you couldn't do. No, the biblical image is we take the raw materials of these humans that God entrusts to us and we study them. We study God's word. We see their unique per personality, what God says will lead to flourishing, and we bring the two together. We bring the right materials to build them up to ultimately not be mini versions of us, but a mini version of Jesus, who loves God passionately, loves other people, and uses the unique personality that God gave them to go make a dent for love and justice and goodness in the world. Th this is the biblical image of parenting. And um, if you were here on Mother's Day, Pastor Larry did an awesome job unpacking what does it look like practically to do that? How do we build up our children in a way that would make them happy and flourishing? And so if you weren't here for that message, I would encourage you uh, to go watch that message this week. Um, because that's something that Scripture has a lot to say about. How do you build your children up? Um, what I want to do for this morning is give you a song that you can sing while you're doing that. So if you haven't heard Pastor Larry's message, I put a link in the discussion guide this week. Go watch it. That's the task that we're called to. I just want to give us a song to sing while we do it. Because here's what I know. Some days, it doesn't feel like this incredible adventure of pulling out our power tools and building something awesome, right? Right? Like, some days, doesn't it just feel like a grind, if you're being honest? Um, you ever have days where you're just hanging on until bedtime? Um, you ever have days where you're just hanging on until maybe the kids will move out of the house? And I think we've all been there, as judged by that reaction. I think one of the reasons this psalm is here is to help us zoom out and remember that what might feel mundane in the moment is actually monumental. The way you handle that spilled milk again, or, or the way you handle those hurt feelings, or the way you handle that crashed car after you told them to drive better than that, the way that you handle each of these little moments is building up and shaping and forming a living legacy that will outlive your time on this planet. That's what Solomon's saying here. That I know it's a grind, but don't forget, it's an adventure. You're building a house. Get out the power tools. If that analogy's not doing it for you, he gives us another. Whoops. In verse 4, he says, children are a blessing from the Lord. They're, they're like arrows in the hand of a mighty warrior. What he's saying is when you build up this living legacy, it, it shoots your impact out far beyond you, far beyond your time and your reach. You are shooting little humans out into the world to fight for love and justice and goodness and grace. What he's saying is your investment in your children will go far beyond you, whether you like the building a house picture or whether you like the shooting the arrow picture. This is what he's communicating. And this is why children are a gift, according to Solomon, because it's a gift to get to do this, right? 
Like how cool that we get to play a part in shaping the future and sending these arrows out into the future to shape a world that we will never personally with our eyes see. But we can leave an impact and a legacy far beyond the time when we're gone. This is the adventure of parenting. And look, I I know a lot of guys who feel bored with their life. And so if, if that's where you're at this morning... Um, I just want you to hear the words of this song for a minute. That if you embrace what parenting really is, you'll never be bored again. And that's true, even if you don't have kids. So so let me just address this before we go any further, because some of you might say, well, that's real nice for those uh, that have kids, but what about me? Okay, well, let's talk about you. Um, One of the things I love is, we say this all the time here, church is like a family, Um, This isn't some cute metaphor we made up here. Uh, This is something the scriptures talk about on repeat, that the church is uh, a family really knitted together around Jesus, that we are um, deeper than even flesh and blood because we're united by the blood of Jesus. And, and so, according to the New Testament, you'll see all these passages where, and Pastor Larry preached on this on Mother's Day. He preached um, from a single man who never married, never had children, writing to his son in the faith. And so, even if you've never married, even if you don't have children, like, you get in on this adventure through Jesus, that Jesus makes you a part of this dynamic family, where there's potential sons and daughters all around you just looking to you to impact them, to pour into their life, to take seriously building them up. Because no parent is perfect and complete, and they need the help of a community. Have you ever heard the idea of it takes a village? Scripture's like, yeah, it does. And so we get this incredible opportunity as a church to do this. And I'll just say this if you're skeptical. Um, My dad wasn't around a ton growing up. And, and, And my dad could tell you, man, his dad wasn't around, and he's taking steps to make that better. But man, my dad wasn't around a ton growing up. And I am here today in large part through faithful men who loved Jesus and who loved me and stepped into that space and helped build me up where maybe I'd have some gaps in my walls. Um, This is the adventure that is placed before us regardless of your season of life. And so whether you're uh, a dad or a mom or you're single, this adventure here is for you. And so I would just say don't sleep on that because there's a real adventure here. That's what Solomon comes out of the gates swinging with. That's the adventure. Now, um, the question you could ask is, well, why doesn't it always feel like an adventure? We talked about earlier, it feels like a grind sometimes. If this is what parenting is, why does it sometimes feel like this? Oh, you've never been there? Okay, so let's talk about that. Let's talk now about the futility of parenting. Um, The other day, I was in the kitchen making dinner, and I heard some bickering from the other room. And you you know as a parent, you just kind of learn to tune that out. One kid's fighting with the other kid, and you're like, they'll work it out. Man, you guys are making me feel like the worst parent ever. Anyone ever do that? <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, and so I, I'm in there, and I'm making dinner. I'm like, oh, I'm making dinner. This is important. They'll figure it out. And, and then all of a sudden, the volume raised. And what started with bickering gave way to tears. And then all of a sudden, I hear the pitter-patter of feet come in my way. And I know what kid that is. Um, it's never the offending party that comes to dad, Right? That kid runs. And so, sure enough, Maddie comes to me with tears in her eyes, and she says, Brookie hit me. And and I asked her, I was like, what do you mean hit you? And she balled up her little fist. She, bam, right in the right arm. Now, a couple of things you need to know about my house if you don't know them. Number one, um, Something Karen and I have been working with the kids on is learning to resolve their issues by talking about it. 
Um, because they're at this age where they're starting to really develop personalities, which is really fun and sweet. Um, it also means they're starting to fight over stuff because they have stronger preferences. And so every two seconds in our home right now, it feels like some kid is pulling Karen and me in to mediate. And so we've been working with them for a while on, you need to learn to talk this out between the two of you before you come to mom and dad. There's stories in the Bible, like Moses tells Israel this, like, you guys have got to figure that out before you come to me. Like, this is, yeah, you guys, so we've been working for a while. Use your words, talk it out with your sister. Don't come to us as a first resort. Talk to each other, have a relationship. And frankly, I thought that was going pretty well for a while. Until Brookie went all Rocky Balboa on Maddie. And so that leads to the second thing. So we've been working on this. this. is something you need to know. The other thing you need to know, if you don't know me, is I live with four women. <laughs> Which means that uh, fist fights and like close hand hitting is about as common in my home as a unicorn is in yours. Unless your house is like ours and you have unicorns everywhere. I don't mean that. I mean like it never happens. The kids have never seen me and Karen get into an argument and just go fisticuffs to try to solve that argument. And so I went to Brooke. And, and you know, I first had to confirm the story because, you know, the Bible says, hey, someone's going to seem persuasive till you talk to the other side. So I'm like, tell me what happened with your sister. She goes, ah, I hit her. Okay. Um, and I asked her, like, where did you learn that? And she said, I saw so-and-so do it. Now, she didn't say so-and-so. I'm sparing you the name in case his parents ever see this. <laughs> but it's a boy in her class at school. And so here, here's where my mind goes in this moment. I'm like, what am I even doing here? Have you ever felt that way as a parent where you've been working on something? You're building up. You're going, it's going really well. And then along comes some boy at school and... <laughs> Ever been there? <laughs> Ever feel frustrated? Ever feel like, what am I even doing if this was, I, I put so much energy and attention into this, and one little boy comes along, and it's out the window. And I know I'm not even to the teenage years yet. I hear what I'm saying as I say it, all right? But any of you ever been there where you're just like, I think I want to quit parenting today? Yeah. Okay. I love that the Bible gives us a word for that. Vanity. It's the most common word in this song. It comes up again and again and again. Unless the Lord builds a house, those who build it labor in vain. Um, that word, I don't know how you hear that. My mind goes, you're so vain. You think this song is about you. It's not talking about that. <laughs> um, this word, um, vanity, it's referring to something that's basically pointless. Kind of like arguing with someone on the internet. Not going to change their mind. Th that's vanity. And, and this is a word that, um, if you know anything about Solomon's biography, Solomon wrote um, the book of Ecclesiastes um, at the end of his life. So quick background on our boy Solomon is, um, man, he uh, grew up with a, a godly father, loved the Lord, um, God gave him wisdom while he was sleeping in the night, made him the wisest person on the planet. He's the king of God's people. It's all going really, really great until he starts dating the wrong girls and, and starts chasing the wrong things, and his whole life goes off the rails. And at the end, and so he begins to say, maybe God was holding me back. Maybe I could find life out here, just like we've all done. And at the end of his life, he writes the book of Ecclesiastes, really, I believe, is an act of repentance. Because here's the message of Ecclesiastes. He talks about what a waste of time it is to look for life outside of God, to try to chase it through sex and romance and riches and power and authority and possessions. The whole book of Ecclesiastes, it's this idea on repeat. I thought women could make me happy. Vanity. I thought being in charge politically could make me happy. Vanity. I thought having lots of money could make me happy. Vanity. I thought having lots of stuff and going places and having experiences and not money would make me happy. But vanity. This is the constant repeat, the refrain of Ecclesiastes. He said, it's all a waste of time. If you think you're going to find God out there, you ain't going to find it. 
And so it's so interesting when he talks about parenting that he uses this word vain, vanity. In other words, it's like what he's saying is, um, you know, parenting often feels like a waste of time because it is. He says, you could give it all you've got. And then along comes some boy. They move away to college. And it's vanity. It's pointless to try to shape them. Unless the Lord builds. Because the point is, this is an adventure far too big for you and for me. And so I just want to ask you this question. Do you really believe that? Like, I know theologically we would say, sure, I believe that unless God shows up, nothing's going to happen. I, I know what you might say on your statement of faith, but I mean, do you actually believe that in your bones with how you live your life? Do you believe that this whole act of trying to build is pointless unless God shows up? Do you pray like it? Because that's where this psalm has really been sitting with me in the last week. We talked about this week, one of this series, that these are songs, that these are prayers that are turned into songs so that they would stick with God's people. And you, you ever get a line from a song stuck in your head? Unless the Lord builds the house, the workers labor in vain. We'll get Phil to write a tune for that. But that's the line that's been kicking around in my head. Because look, just real talk, like I think about parenting and I think like, It makes perfect sense to me that parenting is hard. And my kids are five, almost six, and seven. Like, I know it gets harder. Like, it makes perfect sense to me to say parenting is hard. Just making that jump to the fact that parenting is futile, it's hard for me to make that jump. Again, not in theory. I have good theology. I'm talking about how I live my life. I tend to think of parenting as hard, not impossible. Not a waste of time. I don't tend to think of parenting like arguing with someone on the internet. And it's why I think I tend to pray as a last resort. And and look, if you walk in here and you're at your wit's end, it is never a bad idea to pray as the last resort. It's never too late to pray and talk to the Lord and cry out from wherever you're at. I'm not trying to shame you for that. I'm just talking my experience, my story, what the Lord's been highlighting to me is I think some of us get discouraged as parents when we try to carry a burden that ain't ours to carry. It's kind of like this weight I have down here. Um, We have a room in our house that uh, serves the dual purposes of being a workout room for Coach Karen and a playroom for the children. And uh, yesterday, I was using it as a workout room, and um, I was pretty beat when I got done, and so I did not clean it up. I sent a great example for my kids. Uh, And so my five-year-old, sweet little five-year-old, decides to try to clean up the weight room stuff so she can play. And so she comes up to this weight and (laughs) it's seriously like this. (laughs) She's like, Dad, I can't lift it. (laughs) She wanted to play. She wanted the room back. But no matter how hard she tried, it was like arguing with someone on the internet. Wasn't going to do a darn thing. And, And so I walked over there and I said, hey, sweetie, watch this. And she was like, whoa. I think she thinks I'm a superhero now. (laughs) And what I told her is, that's for grown-ups, not for you. You're not meant to be able to lift that weight. That's for grown-ups. 
This is too big for you. And look, sometimes I think we are like my five-year-old. Trying to lift this thing of parenting. And we're so stressed out and we're so anxious because we can't get it off the ground. And the Lord's saying through the song, that ain't for you to lift. And what prayer is, is calling dad into the room and saying, can you move that out so I can play with my toys? Prayer looks like giving that burden to the Lord. Saying, unless dad shows up, this ain't moving. Unless the Lord builds the house, the workers labor in vain. I wonder what it would look like for you in your life to embrace that truth. To embrace the futility of parenting apart from the Lord showing up. Um, For me, here's what it's looked like. It's looked like starting to think through intentional prayers I can pray for my girls when things are good before they come running to me crying. Because I'll just be really honest, this might shock you to hear coming from a pastor. Um, I pray with my kids all the time because I'm trying to teach them how to pray and talk to God. Um, I pray for my kids when they wake up with a scary dream at night. Like we do this when stuff hits the fan. But on days where I think I've planned the perfect camping trip and everything's going well and I'm lifting this thing and she thinks I'm a superstar... I don't tend to start with prayer. This is just real talk. But if it's true that nothing I'm going to do is going to have an impact, even that perfect camping trip I planned, if it's true that none of that is going to have a lasting impact on their souls and on the world unless God shows up, then for me, I look at that and I go, well, then I want to be praying more. Not like I have to. This isn't a burden saying you should do this. It's like, man, you're telling me I don't want to lift this thing? I could just talk to him? I could get out ahead of this thing? And so I've been thinking about it this way. You know how we have blocks here? And these are kind of cool. They're magnetic. Um, Real life isn't like that. It's more complicated. So think about it like this side. Um, I've started thinking about prayers like the mortar that holds the bricks together. It, it doesn't mean that you're passive and do nothing. No, the workers still show up. They, wor- they labor. The difference is now their labor is not in vain. Because the Lord's going to do this and snap it together and hold it together. This is how good God is, that he loves to work through imperfect parents like us and our crazy ideas and our flaws to somehow build up humans to know him, love him, and to spread that love throughout the world. And so this is what I've been thinking about. I've been thinking about, okay, how can I get out ahead of this thing and start praying? Um, and this is where social media has really great value. I saw a pastor friend of mine posted this this week. The Holy Spirit lit me up with this. I'll just unleash it on you. He said, I don't want prayers to go unanswered for my kids because I never prayed them. And so for me, that's what it looks like to embrace the futility, is to, instead of do this so much, to do some of this, like, get over here. This is where the analogy kind of breaks down, because it's not like we sit there while God lifts the weight. God works through us. Every analogy breaks down eventually, all right? But, w- but what does it look like for you? Um, as I've been bra- embracing this, here's some just real talk. Nothing in my home has changed in the last week that I'm aware of. But here's what I will tell you. I've felt less stressed if my own parenting fails in the last week as I've been embracing the futility of it. Um, I have felt more hopeful for my kids, even though there's these crazy boys running around trying to poison their minds. Because of this. Again, I don't know what's going on in my kid's heart. I I don't know. I'm just telling you what's going on in my heart. (laughs) 
That's what I believe this psalm is here to do for us. It's here to help us breathe out and relax and to stop straining so hard to lift something we weren't meant to lift. But to breathe out and relax and embrace the fact that on our own we can't do this, but if we call Dad over together, he can work through us to build something incredible. That's what I believe this psalm is here to do for us, to help us embrace the futility of parenting apart from him because we weren't made to do it alone. And look, that idea right there that I believe is the big idea of this psalm, I'm well aware that could sound terrifying if you don't know the Lord. To hear that your parenting is futile unless the Lord shows up, I get where that could sound terrifying if you don't know the Lord. But Solomon does. And so right in this heart of this psalm, he reminds us what God is like. And so let's now look at the rest. Let's look at what God is like according to Solomon. Let's look back at verse 2. He says this, It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. For he gives to his beloved sleep. Um, The fact that Solomon calls himself beloved right there amazes me. Um, th- this is kind of a wordplay on um, the Hebrew name Jedediah, which means beloved of God, the one that God loves. Um, if you know Solomon's story, when he was born, God said, hey, call him Jedediah because I love him. I've set my love on him. I'm affectionate for him. This was a name that would have been spoken over Solomon from a time he was a little child, that you're the beloved of God. He loves you. He is for you. But we just talked about his story. In full view of that, after seeing God's love in action through giving him supernatural wisdom, after seeing God's love in action through his leadership that enabled him to build the temple, after seeing God's presence fall from heaven and light up the temple mount, and after seeing the nations travel from all over to see the blessedness of God's people where God dwells, after all of that, this guy said, maybe there's a better deal out there. And he walked away from the Lord, and he chased after foreign gods, and he built temples to other gods, and he ran as far from God as one could run, and he brought the nation with him. And after all of that, he comes back to the Lord at the end. And he writes this psalm, and he calls himself beloved. Like, that amazes me that after all of that sin and all of that rebellion, it could occur to him. And this is true. This is the gospel that no matter how far you run, he will run farther to bring you home. No matter how much sin you have sinned, his grace is greater and his ability to save and redeem is bigger than your ability to mess things up. And so here at the end, he writes this psalm for us and he's like, don't forget what God is like. That he still loves us after he runs, that he calls us beloved, even after we have made a mess of our lives. This is the good news of this psalm. You know how much you love your kids? You know how much your heart goes out to them in just irrational ways? That you're just for them. What the scriptures tell us is that is but a shadow and a faint echo of God's heart for you and for me. Hear me. Not on your worst days, because some of you are like, right now, I'm very frustrated with my kids. I'm not talking your bad days. You're human. This is Jesus' whole point. He argues from lesser to greater. He's like, hey, you know how much you love your kids? Well, if you who are evil and have up and down days with your kids, how much more does God love you who's perfect and never has a down day? I'm talking your 
best day, the most you've ever loved your kids. According to the scriptures, that is but a faint echo of God's love for us. This is why he reveals himself as a father who loves his children. No matter how far we run, no matter how much we fail, he is a father who will chase and run after us and give more grace to work and to woo to ultimately bring us home and bring us back to the only place of true rest in his presence. Isn't that what Jesus said when he came to earth? Come to me, all of you who are tired and weary, and I'll give you rest. So hear this, when it When it says, unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain, it's not saying unless some absentee father shows up. Maybe that's your story and you have some father wounds. And so you hear this and you're like, this is terrible news. Solomon wants to remind us of what God is like, that he is a perfect father, that even the best fathers on earth we have are just a shadow and a glimpse of him, that he's a dad who always shows up for his kids. That he gives his beloved rest. And and see, that's good news that you and I can relax into. In the midst of our mistakes, in our regrets. Like I know Father's Day brings up so many emotions for us. Um, if, if you're in here this morning and you just feel wrecked with regret, you go, I missed the opportunities. I didn't put the wall up. I didn't put the door on. I, I didn't build. What I hope you hear from this psalm is that you are God's beloved. And his love for you doesn't hinge on how well you're doing as a father. His love for you is set on you because he chose you. He loves you. And he made you and thought you up and has this kind of affection for you that the best fathers on earth are only a mere shadow of. And just like he brought Solomon home to true rest, he'll bring you home no matter the regrets you have if you would just come home to him today. And say, I've got all of this regret and I don't want to carry it anymore. Could you be gracious to me like you were, Solomon? He gives to his beloved rest as a truth you can rest into, relax into in your mistakes and regrets. I will also say this. I think that's a truth you can relax into in the midst of your anxieties. Any parents ever stay up late at night worrying about your kids? Um, This is a verse that I just prayed would be ringing. The Holy Spirit would ring out in our hearts on those nights. He gives to his beloved sleep. Here's what I'll tell you. That is a promise that sometimes you will just have to take hold of and sing it back to him and pray it back to him. Say, God, I... I'm so anxious, I don't want to be, I want to be able to sleep, I'm freaking out right now. You say you give your beloved rest, so work the miracle here. Would you help my heart believe that I can sleep because you're not going to, and you're big enough to keep working even while I'm sleeping? Solomon knew that God was that big because he did some of his best work while Solomon was sleeping, blessing him with wisdom. Solomon knew that he could relax into the love of God because he could look out in the distance and see the temple that he built as a young man in his faithful days. This house that he built, but ultimately the Lord was working through that process to build this house to declare to the nations what he was like. And he could remember how he wandered from that temple to the temples of other gods. And he could look out and see the temple and go, are you kidding me that after I went to all those other temples, he brought me back to this place? Solomon 
could receive the futility of parenting is good news because he knows what God is like. He knows that God loves to show up for his kids. If we would simply come and ask, he could receive it that way. And how much more reason do you and I have to see this is good news? We have not just a temple building that we can look out at. We have God's own son come into the earth, a living, moving, breathing temple where God dwelled among us. So we don't just know this because we look at and see the temple. We, we know that God is a God whose love we can relax into because Jesus went to the cross and bled and died and rose again so he could bring us home to a heavenly, eternal rest and hear the words of Jesus. That rest is not just an idea someday for after you die, but that rest, according to Jesus, is meant to begin now as he dwells with you by his spirit, or as Jesus said it, Come to me, all you who are weary and in need of rest, and I will give you rest for your souls. That's the ultimate invitation of this psalm. To embrace the futility. Because you weren't meant to do this on your own. To breathe out this morning. And to let your breath become a prayer that connects you to your perfect Father in heaven who loves you right where you're at. Not the future version of you that's got this all figured out, but the real you, meth and all. He calls beloved to come home to him with whatever your burdens are and to pour those out to him and to enjoy the adventure of shaping and building wherever he calls you to it. Let's pray. Father, it's, um, it's incredible to me that we get to call you that. Thank you for being a God of love who sets your love on flawed, finite, broken people like us. Thank you for giving us not just your words through Solomon, but by sending your own son to show us in flesh and blood what your heart towards us is like. And so I ask as we begin to respond to this word that you would just send your Holy Spirit. God, so many of us are carrying father wounds and baggage that we can't even hear that word just right. And so I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to fill in the gaps in our stories this morning. That maybe where we have pain, you would minister to us in that spot. That you would help us to see you, not as the father we had maybe, but the father that we long for and needed, because that's who you are. Would you help us to see your heart like Solomon did? Would you help us to see that we're beloved in spite of what we've done, so that we might come to you? So we wouldn't try to lift this weight on our own, but that we could do it with you and in partnership with you and enjoy a true adventure and experience true happiness and blessing in our parenting. We can't do this on our own, and so we ask for your help. In the beautiful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.